Reverend Father, venerable religious and dear parishioners, I remember something that happened to me when I was a seminarian, a religious brother at the time. This was probably in the late 70s or early 80s, and one of the duties that we were sometimes given is to show people around the mount and you know, give them a tour. And I forget the exact size of this group. I think it was only about 10 people, but I was showing them around and I remember the reaction of one man who I found out was a fundamentalist Protestant. And he, I just remember him shaking his head as I was pointing out the beauty, the size of the building, especially of the chapel. And he had a very negative reaction, shaking his head and just thinking, This building is a scandal. (laughs) Some fundamentalists think you just shouldn't have any kind of buildings, large buildings, anything, you know, impressive. I can only begin to imagine what he would have said if he had seen St. Peter's in Rome, far bigger and, and more beautiful. Now, at the time, I didn't know a good response to him. His taking offense at having a building like this, at having a beautiful chapel. By the way, it's been commented on over and over and over and over again by visitors, many of them non-Catholic, how inspiring and beautiful our chapel is. You know, we who come in here every week and more, we can forget, we can get used to it. But anyway, I didn't know what kind of response to make. And then years later, in doing apologetic studies and using that marvelous three-volume series, Radio Replies by Fathers Rumble and Carty, These were two priests in Australia who had a radio show and people would call in with all their attacks and criticisms of the Catholic faith and the responses are marvelous. I would say all of you should have a copy of Radio Replies in your home. It's been reprinted. You can buy a new copy. It's three volumes, so you can buy new copies. You can buy used copies. It will answer practically everything every single criticism and objection to the Catholic faith and in a marvelous way. All of these were transcribed and they're in writing. So anyway, I'm reading in one of these radio replies, questions and answers, well, actually a called in question or criticism, and one of them was echoing what I heard from that man years ago. Scandal, taking scandal at the beautiful churches that Catholics build. And this caller, who was some kind of fundamentalist, uh, belonged to some fundamentalist denomination, was saying, Christ lived poorly. He was born in a stable. Why do you think you should be building these things? And this one sentence reply just gives you an idea of how well the, these books are written, or these radio replies were given. And one of the priests said, this was in the 1930s, by the way, this, these radio replies. He said, yes, it is true that Christ humbled himself, but it is not our duty to humble Christ. What a marvelous answer. Our Lord chose to live very poorly and meanly. But that was his decision. Our decision should not be that. Rather, our decision should be to have the most beautiful church possible. Why? Because that's a reflection of our faith. It's a reflection of our love. 
And if we built a poor-looking, poverty-stricken chapel, that would be a humiliation of Christ himself. How dare we do that? We wouldn't. That's why churches where God lives, not just spiritually but physically, should be the most beautiful buildings. I truly believe that every church, when somebody goes inside of it and looks at it, will see a reflection of the parishioners. I mean, after all, who is it that supports it and makes it possible? The parishioners. And the more faith and love the parishioners have, the more willing they are to contribute to the building of or the maintenance of God's house. On my trip to Italy, I saw evidence of the ages of faith. There are churches standing there, especially, that, in my estimation, will never be built again. Why? Because we no longer live in the ages of faith. Society as a whole doesn't believe and serve God as it should in a public way. And so instead of beautiful, marvelous churches being built, what do we see being built? Skyscrapers sports arenas or, or other large auditoriums. And it's more for the glory of man. But here, hundreds and hundreds of years later, after they were built, Notre Dame Cathedral, for example, one of the most well-known churches in the world, has been standing for 800 years. And it takes people's breath away to this day. It has all the elements of good church architecture. We've talked about the three laws, the verticality, which just gives you that upward feel. And that's where we want our prayers to go, the massiveness of it and the beauty of it. Our church here, this chapel actually, when the Jesuits were building it, they tried as best they could to incorporate those laws of church architecture as well. Having the highest ceiling possible for the, for the upward effect of prayer. Have, building the building, the chapel, in a very solid way shows the solid solidity of faith. And then the beauty. The stained glass windows. How marvelous they are. By the way, I'm reminded of the three aspects of beauty. You know, we've all heard the saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, that's not entirely true. What that means is the subjective aspect of beauty. And it means that we all have different tastes, and that's all right. But beginning with Aristotle centuries before Christ and reinforced by St. Thomas and all the philosophers, they also told us that there are three objective qualities of beauty, three objective aspects, and it doesn't matter what the beholder may feel about it. In and of themselves, beauty is there. And they come from the infinite beauty that is God. And those three aspects of beauty are integrity, harmony, and clarity. And we will never be able to get away from those objective aspects because it's in the very nature of things. No matter how many more centuries this world exists, those are there. Integrity, what does that mean? All the parts are there that should be there. You know, if a building that's nicely constructed, you can see one part, a floor that is missing, you say, it looks, something's missing there, doesn't, something's odd, it's not right. If one loses a bodily member, that's a loss of some integrity. Harmony, how well do the parts interplay with each other? Are they... In good, are they a good fit with each other? I tell in my philosophy class, you know, uh, you know, what if 
your ear was, you know, three feet big. Be way out of proportion to the rest of the body. The harmony would be lacking. But God, when he made our bodies, he made them integral. He made them in harmony. And there's also the third quality, the inner clarity, the inner brilliance that should shine out of something. Do we see those three qualities here? Do we see integrity? Do we see what should be here? Yes, we do. Whether it's the altars, the stained glass windows, even the room itself, it's, it has integrity. Does it have harmony? Does everything work together? Yes, it does. And this is God's providence. The first bishop of Spokane, uh, Bishop Schinner, was the bishop of Superior, Wisconsin, before he was assigned by Pope St. Pius X to be the first bishop of Spokane. And he built an orphanage in Superior, Wisconsin. And the, the, all, the three altars that are from that orphanage, yes, we were able to rescue them from the wrecking ball. They were brought here and they fit perfectly. Our chapel. Isn't that marvelous coincidence? Not providential. His orphanage followed him to Spokane many years later after his demise. It's in harmony. And finally, is there a clarity? It's, that's probably the least defined aspect. How do you define clarity or brilliance? It's more of something you just know is there rather than something you can describe. It just shines out. And this is what people remark on over and over and over again. You have such a beautiful chapel. So why is this beautiful chapel here? It's for him. He deserves the best that we can give him. He deserves what we give him and more. And today, he will walk among us. He will not just be inside this beautiful chapel. He will walk outside, and something's going to happen that only happens once a year. We know that our Lord is everywhere as God, and he sees everything, but his human eyes are confined to this chapel. And so when he walks outside as I carry him, he will see you, not just with his divine eyes which see everything, his human eyes will see you. And they will, of course, look into your heart. And they will see all the decorations that were lovingly placed along the way. And he will bless all those who in faith and love put those there. And he will see all of his faithful children gathered around him as we honor him with this very special procession. That's why we do it. Our Lord will not have to lay his eyes on modern art in our procession today. And, you know, in Europe, as here, modern art has taken over. And it, does, it lacks those three objective qualities of beauty. Well, maybe it has integrity, but the harmony or the brilliance is not there. And yes, count on the modernists in this beautiful cathedral, in this beautiful basilica, to plop down an ugly altar. I can't even call it an altar, it's a table. Or an ugly lectern. I can guarantee you that the millions of people that go to these holy places don't go there to see any modern art. They go there for the beautiful churches that were the evidence of the ages of faith. You see, art, art's definition has changed in the last 100 or 50 years. Instead of revealing, having those objective qualities of beauty, it's more about what kind of a reaction can I get out of people? And unfortunately, that's become the focus of modern art. It's not the art of Michelangelo and Raphael and Giotto and Bramante. 
It's the art of shock. It's the art. I'm not even going to call it art. It's, it's the, the, the focus is on reaction. What kind of, you know, what, what kind of people will, what, how, how will they react to this? And it's, it's ugly. It's lacking beauty. But we know what is beautiful. We know what is physically beautiful. And we are making sure that it's all physically beautiful. Again, that's what appeals to us. But most of all, we want to have beauty in our soul. And I leave you with this thought. How beautiful is your soul? How much integrity and harmony and brilliance is in your soul? Our Lord gave his his body and blood in Holy Communion to help make our souls more beautiful, to wash away the ugliness of sin. Sin always makes the soul ugly. But every Holy Communion gives a beauty and a luster. And if we persevere in faithfully receiving Holy Communion, we will have the pledge of immortality. He who eats of this bread and drinks of this chalice as our Lord says, shall live forever. So let us rejoice in this day, the Feast of Corpus Christi observed on Sunday. Let us give all praise, all adoration, all love, thanksgiving, and joyful celebration in honor of our Lord in the most blessed sacrament. And let us thank him, let us always make everything we can, both in physically and spiritually, as beautiful for him, for the God of infinite beauty. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.